Yeah, my task was to talk about eras for the surgeon. And that is quite a wide topic, which is kind of hard to cover. So I, I will just give you some personal reflections on, on eras and what it means for me like a surgeon, as a surgeon. So I, I will start with the surgeon himself or herself. Uh, this is a quite interesting study from Norway that claims that 95% of the surgeons consider themselves as belonging to the top 5%. And at first you just laugh at it, you know. Uh, but then uh, you, you think it's typical for surgeons, you know, filled up with the, their own ego. But, but then if you think about it twice, especially if you're a surgeon yourself, you realize that there is some rational behind this thinking because, I mean, imagine practicing surgery every day, in and out, not being confident that you are not good enough. That is a, a problem, really. It's horrifying. So this is kind of a self-defense that may be necessary for surgeons. Like a mantra, you know, I'm among the top 5%. Now, that, that leads us to the next question, which is very important, and that is, what is really a top surgeon? Is there any definition of a top surgeon? And I think most of the people will think at uh, technical skill. Even surgeons themselves would think at technical skill. That, that is a top surgeon. But that is really hard to measure. Uh, what is te good technical skill? It could be kind of subjective. So this is a study that uh, aims to compare uh, surgical skill or technical skill. Uh, it's uh, about gastric bypass patients. Uh, the surgeons were video filmed, and then ret retrospectively they checked up on complications. And they saw that uh, in the top, uh, the least skilled surgeons had nearly tripled the rate of complications. And they ha had also longer time of, of, or duration of surgery. But all these kind of studies are full with bias. And you can't really you can't really take them for, for granted. And I'm sure that at least for 75% of the surgeons, difference in surgical skills is, are in minor important for post-operative outcome. So then, if you, if you say that, is it okay then that 75% uh, of the surgeons consider themselves as belonging to the top 5%? couldn't be any harm in that. Maybe it's good for the healthcare system. Maybe, maybe it's good for all. But the answer is no, because there is one factor that is even more important for as a factor in, in, in the equation, a top surgeon or not, and that is clinical judgment. And in order to have a good clinical judgment, you need to be interested in, in perioperative care. And you need to, to use uh, evidence-based medicine. And I'm, I'm sure that no surgical skill in the world can make up for lack of clinical judgment. And now to the main question. What is ERAS for the surgeon? I have the answer on the next slide. It is a manual of clinical judgment. Uh, this is my thoughts. It could be wrong. But this is what I think. Look at the, the, the iceberg. You have outcome on the y-axis, and, and on the x-axis you have pred predictors. The top side, 10%, the sunny side that everyone can see and, and, and be impressed of is technical skill. And then down below the surface, you have all these area with clinical traps that can jeopardize outcome from surgery. And you are, if you use evidence-based medicine, in a structured way, like using the ERAS items, you could avoid a bad clinical outcome. So uh, you have to remember that the ERAS concept or fast track concept or enhanced recovery after surgery is quite new. And if you look at, at uh, how things were before, at least before the year 2000, uh, there were no perioperative protocols whatsoever. The surgeons used their gut feelings to treat the patients perioperatively. They were mainly open surgery. 
And the thing is, the surgeons didn't know anything about the results because there were no documentation. And even worse, if there was a documentation, it was done by the surgeons themselves. And we know for sure that that, that will be an almost 100% underestimation of complications. So just a few examples. Uh, I did my residency at a small hospital in a Swedish uh, smaller town. And there they had really skilled old surgeons, but they had no perioperative protocol. And they didn't know anything about the, the morbidity. But the length of stay after colonic surgery was at least 14 days. I did some practice in Uganda in Makerere University Hospital for four months. And in fact, all the surgeons at that hospital were really skilled. The caseload was, uh, in one year in Uganda was like a lifetime in a, uh, for a European surgeon. But the results were catastrophic. You know, the, all the patients were malnourished and they had uh, length of stay at least 30 days and a huge amount of morbidity. So, in the year 2000, the, the data from the Danish uh, uh, Vidovre Center came, and nobody really could believe it was true. I mean, compare the, the length of stay, two days after surgery, it was really impressive. And this uh, data was, uh, uh, was verified later in several studies, as you can see, these are early ERAS data, 10 days length of stay in traditional surgery and two, three days in fast track surgery. Nowadays, traditional surgery or traditional perioperative care has gone much way be better, and, but the still, still the risk is, the risk reduction is almost 50% and 2.5 to three days shorter length of stay after surgery. So, there are a lot of, of gain in, in practicing the, the ERAS protocol. This slide you have only, uh, already seen just shows one model of an explanation of why the, the ERAS protocol works. We could just jump to the next one. Oh. Sorry. This, if, you, if, you add, if you add the all the ERAS items to, to that model, you could reduce surgical stress and reduce the risk of insulin resistance and hyperglycemia, which in turn is a huge risk for, for uh, increased risk of complications. And this, this uh, slide you have already seen, uh, talking about uh, showing the functional capacity between traditional surgery and the ERAS protocol. Now, to the specific items. How do we know which items we should use? Could you just skip half of the items? Or if you look at these two centers, centers A with 22 items and a compliance 65%. Compliance meaning that are they really using the items they, they claim they do? And the other center using six items and a compliance on 95%. How many of you would choose center A? How many would choose center B? Seems to be center B that is the favorite. No lack of voting though. Uh, in fact, we can't answer the, that question. We don't know really what items to use. Last or two years ago, the ERA Society made an effort to do uh, an evaluation of all the items according to the grade system. And as you can see, there are items with low evidence, for example, information or preoperative carbohydrate drink, compared to items with high evidence level, like no bowel prep or no sedatives. But it's a problem with this, because you can't really say that, that even if the evidence are high or low, it, it is very depending on the studies uh, designed for all the items. I mean, some, some, some items you can't really design good studies. And then, of course, you have low evidence. 
So you can't automatically say that, that these items shouldn't be used in the protocol. I'm going to give you a few examples on, on that soon. Uh, one way of measuring if items are worth using are looking into compliance. Unfortunately, there are very few studies uh, conducted so far within the ERAS protocol that, that uh, takes on that problem. Although we have two studies, one uh, with an overall compliance, this is a study of nearly 1,000 patients with an overall compliance at 71%. And the two only independent predictors of outcome were intravenous fluids and preoperative carbohydrate drink. The next study looking at compliance is the LAFA study, the Dutch LAFA study, with an overall compliance at 60%. And they found independent predictors of outcome, laparoscopic surgery, early food, and early mobilization. Then, let's go back to the evidence level slide. All these independent predictors of outcome are low level of evidence items. So that, that explains the troubles we have with just excluding some, some items. You can't do that, it's impossible, as it looks for now, currently. Uh, just a, uh, an information, the new ERAS database gives us huge opportunities to check out compliance. I really recommend that you, at your centers, ERAS centers, have let's say have a meeting every third month and look on to compliance, compare with other hospitals, see if you're good enough. It's really good for the organization. So just one summary slide uh, before a bonus slide. Uh, this is a summary. Make sure that uh, you at least belong to the top 75%. Make sure you practice uh, evidence-based medicine and enhance recovery after surgery. And currently use all items in the ERAS protocol and regular, regularly check for compliance. And that, then just this bonus slide. You know, uh, we had, did a study at Erster, Erster Hospital where we looked at compliance level of compliance, more than 90%, more than 80%, more than 70%, and less than 50%. And we could see that, that there was almost a dose-response relationship between high compliance and less morbidity. Now we have done a checkup at uh, uh, cancer-specific five-year survival, comparing all these groups in the cohort. And we could see Pranel, uh, Preliminary, pre, how do you say? Preliminary data shows that, that there seems to be a difference. That if you have low compliance to the ERAS protocol, uh, survive, five year survival seems to be less significantly. And the model for that, to explain, explain that, it's, it is difficult. But perhaps if you get complications and surgical stress, you're immune response will, will be lower. We'll see. Thank you.